Hello and welcome to Teaching My Cat to Read, the very serious book review podcast. This time we are doing our second episode on Temeraire by Naomi Ovik, because we talked about it last time and we want to talk about it more. <laughs> because we're terribly disorganised. That's the actual <laughs> secret. We're terribly disorganised and we were like, how much yelling can we fit in Into this 40 minutes. one yeah. hour slot? Not enough! If you haven't listened to the previous episode, we recommend you pause this one, go back, listen and then come back to this one. It'll make more sense. It will make a lot and I this one is gonna make much sense if you haven't listened to the other one. <laughs> we can do another summary. We can do a very quick like Yes. Okay, so the summary of the book for those of you who weren't listening last time is Random naval captain accidentally adopts dragon. This is part one of the book. Part two of the book, how to train your dragon, but with 1800s Austin protagonists instead of fictional Vikings. Uh, part three, fight Napoleon, but with dragons. Does that cover everything? Also, the dragons are all cats. Yeah. <laughs> that, that basically does cover everything about this book and why it's awesome. TM. I have completely messed up with this whole pop filter thing, guys. I'm like holding it in place. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. I'm <laughs> to not continue giving up on the theme blanket, of us being disorganised. You say that, but we got to the end of the episode last time. We just went. That wasn't enough. I want. I want seconds. I want more. <laughs> like you know when <laughs> Thor is in, in in the film and he's just like, I want more. It's like yeah, that 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 that. Was yeah, we're, just, we're all throwing week. our mugs down in front of the pop filters to our editor's dismay and being like, another, another. <laughs> So one of the things we wanted to talk about last time and we didn't get around to talking about was the lady dragon captains. Yay! Because there are there are certain species of dragon in the book which only will consent to have a captain that is a woman. Oh, hey, no, I don't just want to talk about the lady dragon captains. I want to talk about all the women. Oh, like, yeah, this, of course. This is a really nice thing about, like, oh, so it's a historical fantasy. It would have been really easy for it to operate on the Smurfette principle. And instead we've got, like... So many interesting female characters. Multiple women in my fantasy novel. <laughs> and we didn't talk about any of them, I don't think, really. Except to yell about, like, how Captain Roland is amazing. <laughs> yes, yes, Captain Roland. I love her. She's so great. But I was wondering, like, my inner English teacher came out and I was like, why don't we just, we could just work through them in, like, you know, al- not alphabetical, chronological order of appearance in the book. Like, people who know what they're doing. Yeah, no? I think we should do that. I think we should do that. <laughs> We don't know what we're well, doing. Well, you've, you've volunteered, M, um, to lead this discussion, so... <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if it was clear to you, dear listeners, that we do not, in fact, know what we're doing. Um, Nobody knows the what we're doing. From the last 14-odd episodes. Uh, <laughs> I think we covered that by calling it the Very Serious Book Review Podcast, right? That's fair, that's Clearly fair. Also, tiny-tiny. like, the cat is involved. If I think if a cat is involved, you, you have to know that a cat laughs at all plans of gods and men, so, like... Just chaos gremlin embodiment. Anyway... <laughs> chaos gremlin. <laughs> <laughs> women in this book why are they awesome em tell us <laughs> it's a, a section heading for uh yeah okay so i think the first one we meet is edith who is mm-hmm. like i am unclear on the status of her and lawrence's relationship i don't I know enough like, about like engaged. regency courtship re- rituals i'm just so, like yeah. they're intricate the rituals Ooh, okay. are intricate <laughs> so you know in persuasion where wentworth has been like really friendly with one of the sisters Mm. Yeah, and everyone's just like, okay, now there is an understanding, and that if you yeah. don't in- propose to her, you're going to be considered to have done her a dirty, basically. Yeah, I think that's kind of the situation that Lawrence and Edith are in at the beginning of this mm. book, where mm. right. there is an understanding that they are each kind of spoken for, but they're not mm. actually engaged. Right. At least that's what I took from it. But that may yeah. also have been coloured by having recently read Persuasion and uh, sort of had that kind of, <laughs> that paradigm I mean, fair, of like, relationship my, in mind. My only real, like, model for how anything works in the Regency period is Austen, to be honest, because everything yeah. else I've read set in that period is like, well, it's an Austen novel, but there are dragons, or it's an Austen novel, but there are magicians, or it's an Austen novel, but there's... um. Whatever the hell is going on in Sorcerer to the Crown. I don't know how to describe that magic system. <laughs> um, I, I can't believe you would base your understanding of social mores in this period on an author who wrote extensively about the social mores <laughs> of the period. How dare Outrageous. you? Outrageous. Also, it's, like, it's, it's not exactly a period of history, which is sort of repeated over and over, like, say, the Tudors. Yeah, no, I didn't get school. taught about this in school. It, they just The Regency period, just we just skip it out. It's like, Henry VIII had some wives. Now we're going to jump straight to World War II. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, basically. If your school's making a desperate attempt to be, um, like, a good school that teaches things, they might, might attempt to cover the slave trade. They will do it incredibly badly, no. and you will want to fight them about it. But anyway, moving on, moving on. So we meet Edith. Or moving back, Edith. Edith. Yes, <laughs> who I, I do like, actually. I think, though I don't know whether that's coloured by, like, meeting her again in later books in this series. But, um, Ooh, exciting. I'm, I'm planning to read the later books, and I haven't Ooh, got there yet. But okay, I'm just like, I'll, I, I will stop talking excited, about that. Very excited, so every time Em mentions something from the later <laughs> books, I'm just like... <laughs> but yeah, so I think we meet, like... Actually, we meet, like, three women in, in sort of quick succession, because what happens is Lawrence is taking Temeraire up to um, Dragon Hogwarts for training... And he decides to stop at his parents' house, um, where he we run into Edith, who is pretty much ignoring him, I think. At least in front of other people. And then his mother and a random Miss Montague, is it? Who's like... She's sort of a social climber. Yeah. Almost. She's just like, dragon captain. Blech. Mm. Not going to talk to that. There's this, uh, one of the things I really like about Edith is the sort of the, the, the first mm. time we see her, it's like it's established that she and Lawrence have this mm. understanding that they mm. are headed towards engagement and yeah. marriage. And then he has basically become, by, by becoming a dragon captain, sort of through no real choice mm. of his own, um, yeah. he's basically become ineligible to be married because the life of a dragon captain is just dangerous mm. and lonely and uh, it, uh, un, like sort of incomprehensible to anyone who's not a dragon yeah. captain yeah and you have a dragon you know. yeah yeah and, and you have a dragon which is taking up the bulk of your emotional yeah life. so i think yeah there's two yeah. levels to it because i think there's the there's the social aspect which i think does bother lawrence but i don't think it's like kind of at the crux of anything which is that yeah aviators are regarded as i don't know like i don't know what we don't really have a they're modern equivalent like do we they're, but you they're know? just like you completely like you're allowed to cut them dead in public you don't have to talk to them their reputations are terrible you can't, like, no no decent woman would ever expect to marry one, blah. I think a lot about their reputation, because there was a bit at the at the start where you meet Lawrence, and he's talking about these aviators from a quote-unquote naval perspective. And because everybody in the Navy has all of their uniforms, like, very neatly pressed, well, very tidy, very organised. quite well, No, each. they do on ships that Lawrence runs. Lawrence is very yeah. biased about yeah, which this. Yeah, which his, his runs. But then on the flip side, because the aviators are literally riding a <laughs> green <laughs> dragon, they're like, they're, all of their clothes are messy. And so they get off this dragon and it's all a mess. And everyone looks at the mess mm. rather than saying, they've just flown quite fast on a dragon. And... I think a lot of it comes into stereotype. Like there's this clearly this stereotype mm. behind being a dragon captain means therefore you don't look after how you present yourself and therefore all this other shit that yeah, we're going to Yeah, I mean, assume. I don't know that they're like, I think Yeah, it's, all these it's, other kind of um, performative, like... Mm. I was going to say, I think some of it is like, I think it's, that's an aspect of it, but I think it's it's partially just that they are like completely removed from society. And I think you see later when like, yeah, when they attempt to interact with normal people, quote unquote, like they just don't know the rules, and so people mm -hmm. people read that mm -hmm. as as a lack of moral character because you're allowed to do that in this like social climate. You can be like, oh, this person doesn't doesn't know the unspoken rules of how the precedents and how we talk to people. Therefore, they're not a real person, and I don't have to care about them. But anyway, yeah, I was saying there's like a, I think there's a social status thing. Which I think does disconcert mm. Lawrence because, yeah, it does mean that, like, he can't marry Edith and his father is just really, really mad at him. And a bun there are a bunch of other social consequences that he discusses. But, like, on a personal level, mm. and I think this is one of the things I l really like about Lawrence is that on a personal level, what's important to him is that he recognises that this relationship is going to be the most important relationship in his life. And he wants it that way. And then he he's like, I can't possibly imagine... Like, I can't invite anybody else Having into this because it would be doing them a disservice. And we've gotten off the topic mm. of Edith again. <laughs> well, no, I, I was I was going to bring it back. I was going to bring it back. <laughs> so these are the reasons he can't marry Edith, essentially. <laughs> and what she says is, is like in in another book, you might have her saying, "Well, I'll, I I st I still like you enough to mm. marry you anyway, and set aside these things that I want, and yeah. blah, blah blah, and I will be the wife that waits for you while mm. you're so on." And she doesn't do that. She says, "No, yeah. actually, I like you, and we could have had a good thing." But this is too much and I'm out. Yeah. And it's great. She stands up for yeah, herself. Yeah. And, and, and Lawrence does not at all resent her for it. He goes, you know, that's totally 
yes absolutely yeah. you should advocate for yourself I mean, he almost goes too far the other way doesn't he he's like oh my god yeah. i'm such a cad for even thinking of asking you i've put you in such an awful position yeah. and she's like nah chill man just we're done okay it's all yeah. cool like just- they, they use their words like adults yeah. and express their desires mm. and then you know come to a resolution yeah. and it's just really nice and refreshing in yeah a book like you know it, it, a setting where like in austin people don't use their <laughs> words and it causes all kinds of problems yeah and you could see that situation going pear-shaped quite quickly and in this case it's sad that they won't be together because they do like each other but it is for the best yeah. because of all the reasons we've and you, you very much see yeah. why she and lawrence might have been well suited and that he is the kind of person exactly. that is like Okay, in order to fix this uh, this situation, I'm going to have a quiet... We're going to have a quiet private conversation in which nobody loses their temper and nobody gets dramatic and everybody's just, like, very understanding. Reasonable and... And I was yeah. like, oh, okay. I can see how you two could have worked if only there wasn't a 10 ton dragon mm. situation. Monopolising all yeah. of Lawrence's, like, uh, emotional... Yeah. emotional- bandwidth yeah which again the dragons are just (laughs) the dragon is just like oh this this person it's not even that temeraire would be like Mm. jealous it's just that he just does take up that much emotional space yeah definitely and we love him for it he deserves it he's a good boy and then we get it's interesting as well because i like that like okay so they have this whole conversation about the way the dragon has changed their life but edith never actually speaks to temeraire and then we get Lady oh, Allendale yeah. and Miss That's Montague really meeting him. And that is a study in opposites. Mm. And I really enjoy that. Two diff- very different, of a similar social class, women going to talk mm-hmm. to Temeraire. And they have completely different yeah. reactions. So we get Lawrence's mother, Lady Allendale, whom I adore. And yeah, this random social climber that we mentioned before, who's incredibly rude to Lawrence at dinner the night before. Being like, oh, being a bit of a thrill yeah. seeker. She's like, oh, I want to go see the dragon. Maybe that'll be cool. Which... I'm kind of like, if I didn't know the dragon was a person, I would be like, okay, that's vaguely cool of you to be like, I want to go see the big dangerous thing, actually. But it's Temra, who's a sweetie, and I'm just like, this is disrespectful. This is disrespecting my boy. Yeah. To be fair, I think if I were in that situation, I absolutely would also be like, I want to go and see the dragon yeah, But I, would, I tell you like, what, I would also be like, I want to ride the dragon. And Miss Montague's just like, nope, 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 have to go right now, immediately. That's fair. I'd be like, can I pet the dragon? <laughs> yeah, we would be yeah. Lady Just Allendale, like can basically. I pet the We'd dog? be Lady Allendale, we'd be like, <laughs> yes. oh, he's beautiful, he's so well-mannered, I love him, I'm going to pet his nose. Yeah, I know. I think the difference is, like, Lady Allendale wants to meet Temeraire, and Lady Montague wants to yes. see Temeraire, and like, you know, as if he were an animal in a zoo, whereas Lady Allendale is very much like, this is my son's new yeah. life partner basically in, yeah. a, in a way I think it's interesting yeah. as well yeah I think Lady Allendale is the first person outside of kind of the Lawrence Temeraire partnership that kind of looks at them and goes and like correctly judges the position that Temeraire now holds in Lawrence's life because I get the impression mm-hmm. that like yeah, wider that Regency is society is just like it's like a big scary horse you know it's just an animal and you don't like th- the idea that there's yeah. a relationship is very like yes. it, it just doesn't really even register to people. But Lady Allendale is immediately like, "Excellent, a ten-ton nursemaid for my idiot son who keeps throwing himself into problems." <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, she says to Temeraire, "Like, don't let anything happen." To you. Yeah. <laughs> it's so it's just that whole interaction is so sweet and so just like yeah. awesome. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things going back mm. to like you know, there's multiple women mm. in this book and. Very early on in the book, you get not one, not two, but three different women all having very different responses to this life-altering yeah. thing that's happened to someone they know. Although in the case of Lady Montague, I don't think it's very yeah. well. And it's just really lovely to sort of, yeah, be able to compare and contrast mm. their reactions. Mm. And I think it does a it does a nice job of world building as well, because you get the more different opinions you get on the situation and the more different perspectives. Even like the bits they choose to focus on tell you a lot about society and about them and about how dragons like the concept of dragons and like how that changes the world that we're in like even Mm. if you are familiar Mm. with the regency this is kind of giving you a like here is a crash course on how this looks to other people you know and putting that all in the mouth of yeah female characters instead of kind of yeah continuing what could very easily be just a very male dominated novel i really really like yeah Mm -hmm. yeah it it could have been very easily i say just because i've 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 been reading the hobbit really mm. recently for a future episode and 
it, obviously like you know the hobbit and the whole lord of the rings is a not only product of its time it is like a the, the first fantasy book quote unquote um but it's all men all of the, all of them are men and it was yeah again it was just so refreshing to have all of these female viewpoints yes the protagonist of this book and one of the main characters is a man but that doesn't mean that everyone else is as well and also his interactions with that's other a good women, point yeah we should talk about that how he grows yeah because because he i mean one thing I, I i did notice was when he talks to uh, is it harcourt yes is it who who's the um dragon captain and he says oh he calls her captain and then basically they get together and then he switches to Catherine but he calls her by her her title prior well okay well actually first he um he calls her miss once that is true yes once and then gets corrected and he immediately is like mortified that he has basically disrespected her by not using her her military title because of his sort of implicit bias that like she's just she's a girl like you know she's a young she's a young woman and and he and it, it, in the narrative he says he says to himself i absolutely cannot make that mistake again it would be the height of rudeness mm. and disrespect and yeah. i need to i need to make sure that i get this right and it's, and, precisely because she's yeah. a girl and it's also it's an interesting one i mean i think i think i did mention at the time like realizing during this reread that like in many ways rankin is a nar- is a narrative foil to lawrence um but like the, that's mm. another place where we get contrasted reactions because Lawrence, upon meeting Harcourt, is like, "Okay, I'll be polite in my way. That does that's not correct. I'm yeah. in a different context. Polite means this thing now." I think we Rankin only ever calls her Catherine or Harcourt or Miss Harcourt. He never calls her Captain. Yeah, and that should be that is, I think, a massive red flag. Even without the, her reaction to being forced to sit next to him, is a massive kind mm. of like. Okay, this is the difference. This guy is a prick. Yeah, this guy is a prick. And also, this is why, like, you know, Lawrence is maybe going to be all right in this situation because he is actually yeah. learning. Mm-hmm. I, I definitely felt it was really satisfying to read from a male perspective of this guy going, hang on a minute, I've got privilege here. Mm. I, need to, I need to go and put my, I need to go and, like, check my privilege. I need to go mm-hmm. and get rid of my implicit bias i need to learn to call people by the correct title and i've called her miss because this is how every single other woman i've met in my life has been called but now i've I, i'm ron and i've got to go and learn and it was yeah. just like just really refreshing to yeah. read i don't know and why it, it was really refreshing but it was like he messes up once and that is yeah it. yes like and it's a very consistent process with Lawrence. that's another thing i enjoyed actually was that like he has that moment over and over again. And I'm not just talking about in this book, but he has that moment over and over again where he's put in a situation and his like sort of previous training is like, I should react to this in this fashion. And then he's like, hold on a second. That's not right. I know that's not right. And then he fixes it. Like it. Yeah. I tell you what, like I have been getting frustrated as I've gotten further in with how much with the sort of like, Okay, so maybe maybe sit down and have a think about this outside of the immediate, I've offended someone, what did I do wrong, I'll fix it. But again, I think that is how it works, isn't it? It's a lifelong process and people don't... And like as well, mm-hmm. he doesn't have all the frameworks that we have for talking about this stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, the, the concept of checking your privilege or whatever didn't exist, you know? Like, and the fact that he's doing all of this without a map, as it were, is very admirable. But... I really like the moment where he he realizes what a piece of garbage mm. Rankin is, and he looks mm. back and goes, "I've been befriending this man. I've been very publicly befriending and basically condoning his behavior." Mm. And yeah. he's appalled. He's ashamed of himself. He immediately sets out to figure out how he can fix it, but not from a perspective of "I want to rehabilitate my mm. image," but from a perspective of "I want to make sure I don't continue to make the other captains uncomfortable." Yeah. And it's just like mm. such a great character moment and such a good blueprint mm. for like how to behave in a situation where you've realised that you've done something that makes you ashamed yeah. of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think it going back to Em's earlier point of the reason that there are women in the Dragon mm. Corps be, is because the most dangerous dragons, the most the 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 the, the most um, aggressive ones, will only have female riders. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. That's why there's all these women there, like learning. And then you have it, it, it's is it Baby Roland, mm. the the, the, the yeah. kid mm, Emily. Of, of Mummy Captain Roland, Roland, who turns up yeah. later, which I thought was brilliant. So no, there's like this a little eleven year old girl who's in the core and she wants to be on Temeraire's, I say team, crew, I, don't know what the I guess. The word is, but crew. like on, on the crew. There we go, that's the word. Because they're, they're sort of compared to ships, mm. right? Yeah. In the sense that they have like a captain. And, and like, did they have mid wingmen? That makes me very happy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and I did love how, like, Lawrence just goes around adopting all these yes. small children and then teaching them trigonometry. Yeah. And they're like, why do we have to learn maths? Go away. You're not my real dad. And he's like, you will learn maths and how to wear ties, damn it. <laughs> and 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 so we meet this like kid, the, the, this little girl. And then later on, we meet her mother, who is also a dragon captain. And this is someone who uh, Lawrence ends up getting together with. But yeah, it was just very nice change when he did this moment where he realizes, and I can't remember if we mentioned it in the previous episode, that um the i guess the realization moment like so roland being one of the the what lawrence at the time thinks is a boy who's like helping him out with with tenere yeah. and with levitas and mm, and, yes. and it, oh i remember it was it was the bit the moment where captain roland says oh yeah she's my daughter because they, they these dragons outlive us and it they they prefer to have somebody who's a family relation mm. And she says, we breed ourselves just as much as we yeah, breed Yeah, I think that's another yeah, and interesting... Who, and Loris is just like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, that was the bit I was going to bring up, actually, was this this discussion that he has with her about, like, children and having children. Mm. And, you know, because I think that's something that he had given up on in his mind, along with you know, yeah. Edith. Mm. And the seeing the way that he treats his the crew, like the young members of his crew, is just like dad yeah. material. Except, like, you know, would it would have to be, if he was going to have a kid, it would have to be a kid who understood what Temeraire meant and the relationship mm. and sort of, you know, was okay with the fact that a parental figure was basically, like, also married to their dragon. Yeah. And sort of, it's this really nice bit where you see throughout the book him opening up to, like, an entirely different way of living yeah. where, you know... It, 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 Roland's kid, Emily, is totally fine with the fact that her mum is a dragon mm. captain and the weird life that they have to lead because of that and is an active participant. Um, and, you know, he doesn't have to give up on some of the things that he might have wanted in his life. It's just that they're going to look very yeah. different. I was going to say, I have a, a thinking about that. I think there's, and this kind of leads into the second thing that we didn't talk about, which is kind of um, how having dragons, like, allows you to sort of comment on the, the social the social mores and social mm. justice and things of, of Regency society. But one of the things I think is interesting is that I, what I kind of fixated on for that bit, and I, I definitely agree with Eli that like, there's so much of this that is like Lawrence coming to terms with maybe there's a better way of structuring your life and your relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. I also quite like that conversation because it's, it's an interesting look at sort of, I guess it's it's a blind spot of Lawrence's, but like he's really shocked by the way that Captain Roland says that yeah, that essentially that we breed ourselves as much as we breed yeah. dragons, and he's he's kind of vaguely horrified by that, and sort of like it seems he's he's kind of like oh this goes outside my idea of like you know how family, family. and 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 offspring are married, and it seems like a. He he doesn't particularly enjoy thinking of himself as livestock, I think, which is fair enough. But it's interesting to me that he doesn't make the connection. It's not that different from what marriage among the upper classes is at that time, particularly from a woman's perspective. It's about preserving the bloodlines. I was going to say it's go the other way and say if he is a person and he doesn't like being thought about Mm. this way, and the dragons are people, yes. but they are thought about that way. And also yeah. women are people and don't enjoy being thought about that way. Yeah, I guess yeah. that's what I mean about what I was saying previously, I get a little frustrated in later. Like he get he does get a lot better at it, but I think something that, I guess maybe because as well I'm aware that it's something that I didn't do as much in my younger days and I wish I had, was seeing these like small instances of injustice and discomfort and cognitive dissonance and then taking them through to their logical conclusion... You know, going, oh, I'm mm-hmm. uncomfortable about this, so maybe it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, rather than just like going, oh, this is this is normal, this is normal. You know, yeah. or if or if I feel this way about it, maybe other people feel this way about this. Or I tell you what this is reminding me of, actually, is that have we talked about before the um 
there's a reading of 1984. There's a, a, they talk about like a ghost novel beneath the novel where like, you know, all oh. I was talking about, all oh, this horrible like, oh, these t- it's people trying to carry on a love affair under state surveillance and it's illegal and, and they have to be really careful who they trust and when they're seen together and all of this. And he's imagining yeah, it's, this it's like horrible reading. thing for heterosexuals when when he was writing it at the time, that was what queer love had to deal with constantly. And he's yeah. just completely, potentially unaware that like what he's describing as this horrible futuristic dystopia is literally happening to other people contemporaneously with him writing this f-ing novel. Um, <laughs> and it's the kind of, yeah, it's the sort of like, what if, what if, Lawrence, what if you had to be bred for the good of the nation? And it's like, you mean like literally a bunch of other sapient life that you have you interact with on a regular basis has to. Yep. <laughs> Going back to the gay point, mm. the whole like yeah. re re-examining the structures of your life and evaluating whether or not they actually make you happy and whether or not they make sense mm. and whether or not they're ethical it reminds me of the whole you know if you're queer there's no blueprint for dating it's not like you know who who asks who out who pays on mm. dates who's supposed to do the washing up and who's supposed to do the yeah. gardening all of these things about how your life is supposed to mm. go and these blueprints he's been raised on he has to question yeah. them and that's like that's a that's a big old queer yeah. experience. That is a big gay mood. Well, right I was there. talking to um, a friend of ours about about this, and she was saying that she really really enjoyed Roland and Lawrence, Captain Roland. This is obviously um, yes, Roland's ex- yeah. like relationship with Lawrence because it's very it's very queer because it, he's having to put aside all of these like you know you like we see we've kind of seen the pattern that his he expected his relationships to take right with edith you know you've got you have the unspoken yes, understanding yeah. and then you have engagement and then you get married and have kids and, then and you, you get settle married down and have children yeah and suddenly he's confronted with a woman for whom who we've already established like none of these things are true like your home is your dragon there is no settling down there's no engagement there's no marriage um, you will have kids, but the the approach will be so pragmatic that it will make you kind of uncomfortable. And yeah. So what do you actually want? What do you actually value mm. of that that life that you'd imagined? Which bits do you want to keep and which bits are you willing to work to, to make happen and which bits are you happy yeah. to let go? Yeah, I, I, guess it, I guess it's like which bits did you think, oh, this is going to happen because this is how I've seen it in everyone else yeah. in my life. And mm-hmm. now he's kind of got this this other this, mm. th- yeah this like other life where he he yeah he needs to think about okay i've been i've been raised and thought one mm. way and this is how every single other person in my life has presented this is mm. how life works and now i've got a completely other option and it is also okay to like this other option yeah well, like i love the way that this is really presented by the end of the book as liberating yeah. for him and he is happier mm. he is mm. more fulfilled and he can He's more able to examine, like, well, when the social climber comes back to him at the end of the book and he's like a decorated war hero, basically, and is trying to schmooze with him Mm. because he's now got social status, even though at the beginning of the book she was very dismissive of him, he's able to go, actually, no, I don't value this anymore. I'd rather go back and hang out with my captain friends because they get it. I'd rather even I'd rather go hang out with uh, my dragon and our naturalist friend who didn't realize that he had (laughs) he was a celestial all those months ago. The dragon and the orchestra at the end, just like watching the dragons listening to the music. Yeah. That that was the oh, best bit, I think, God, of the whole so book. It's so cute. I think we talked about that yeah, last it was time. Just, Actually, one yeah. of my favourite moments in the whole book. It's so cute. The warm fuzzies. The warm found family fuzzies. Yep, yep, Fuzzy yep. feeling. I also, I tell you what I did enjoy yeah. as well, that like, while it is portrayed as a very liberating experience for Lawrence, it's also not without its flaws. Because I think that's mm. that's like one of the strengths that he brings to it is the fact that like because he's an outside perspective. I'm gonna harp on about this forever. Like sometimes he's right, or like I agree with him about you know what's wrong with the aerial core because like they let Rankin get away with shit, for example. And sometimes yeah. I think he's wrong. Mm. And I actually wanted to bring this up with the um, Schwazel Harcourt thing because okay, so there's a spoiler alert. There is a French spy who joins them sort of I think about halfway through the book and he claims to be betraying France and he wants to help them because he's anti-Napoleon and all of this yeah and in the end it turns out that he's um been working for Napoleon the whole time because Napoleon threatened to kill his dragon and he basically seduces Harcourt who's like 16 who is who is portrayed to be yeah 15 16 yeah she's she is a girl um and it's it's really interesting because like 
you get a lot of you get the sense of particularly with the with baby Roland that like the aviators are just used to having women around and they don't with the exception of Rankin they don't really see them as being different there's this kind of just like they're just an aviator mm-hmm. like yeah what you you don't have a gender you're just your gender is aviator and you know like I, yeah <laughs> it's about as consequential as the gender of your dragon yeah 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 you know they're just it, it might matter for breeding yeah purposes. basically yeah exactly <laughs> but that's about um, it but that has flaws right because that's presumably why like i mean so lawrence early on notices that schwazel and harcourt are getting close and he kind of goes oh i'm not i'm not sure i'm comfortable with that like there should be a chaperone or whatever and then he's like so like it's a social it's an in- instinct born of his societal yeah. training rather than maybe an ethical one but he's still right but he's going okay i'm not sure that's okay and then he's like okay well we're in we're in the aerial core maybe they do things differently and harcourt can take care of herself Except that yeah. when we find out that Schwazul is a spy and they have to put him in prison and he will only talk to Harcourt and Lawrence goes with her for moral support, we find out that like like Lawrence basically throws the fact that Schwazul has seduced a girl barely past her schoolroom years in order and it's despicable and it's awful yeah. and you're like, hold on a second, like, okay, so it's wrong now, which like pick one, Lawrence, mm. like. You know, it's kind of there's, yeah, a, I mean, there's a double standard somewhere in there, but like I guess the argument would be that it would be just as despicable if it was a young boy, or it was a young a, a, an adolescent, like a teenage boy. I guess, yeah, that's true. But it's again, I guess it's one of those things where I'm sort of like, I think it shows how complicated the whole coming into this thing from the outside is because he, in some cases, Lawrence very much trusts his instincts. And sometimes those instincts are correct, yeah. and sometimes they're not. And this is a case where I think he doesn't trust his instincts. He's like, okay, this is maybe this is just how it is in the aerial core. Maybe yeah, this is how it goes and down. Like, yeah. and you know, and I should like respect the choices of both of the people involved in this. It's not my business. But at the end, he's beating himself up for having made that decision and and kind of being like, well, another angle on it is also when he is uncomfortable with it initially. It's not because he thinks that Shazul might be a spy That's seducing true, her yeah. for you know uh, nefarious purposes. It's because he thinks the age gap is inappropriate mm. and you know. And mm. while that's true, it would be equally horrifying. Well, no, not equally horrifying, but it would be just as much of a betrayal and just as sad if Catherine Harcourt were 29. Yes. Yeah, that's very true. You know, it would be yeah. just as much a betrayal of the relationship that had been built. Yeah, no, that's true. And so, in a way, there are two different discomforts that he's dealing yeah, with. Yeah, and I don't there, think he's think, quite separated he's them the all out. Either. I'm not sure I have even, because I think there's like, there's levels. Mm. Because there's a societal thing yeah. just generally of unmarried yeah. women shouldn't hang, hang out with unmarried men. And that's something that like comes back later when Ro- like baby Roland has grown up a bit and yeah. like mm. and actually like with Harcourt again later as well it comes up and I think Lawrence has a bit of a I think the one thing that I think he doesn't I don't think he quite consciously gets for a really long time is that he still has he's still very he gets a lot better at treating women as equals and he gets a lot better at kind of understanding like you know, that they get to make these choices and, you know, society might be wrong about this stuff. But un- in times of stress, he falls back on those instincts. Yeah, being being paternalistic. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, like wanting to protect, but at the expense of letting people make their own yeah, mistakes. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Because, I mean, there's a really interesting... He talks to, um, I think, when Roland, Captain Roland gets sent to join the fleet at one point... And he has this conversation of like with him, it's a little argument with himself about how he doesn't have, he wants to be like, to protest. And he's like, oh, I, I, I definitely would be as upset about this if I wasn't sleeping with <laughs> Captain Roland, because I think it's really dangerous and I'm not sure it's the right military decision. And you're kind of sitting there like, would you though, Lawrence? You don't have the right. Yeah. She outranks you. She's yeah. a captain. This is none of your goddamn business. Like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it comes back to that whole like, re-approaching like re-evaluating all of like how society Mm. works and how you've been raised which um uh, we wanted to talk last time about how the dragons are a really interesting like they parallel lawrence in this being being Mm. not raised in regular society they're all aviators Mm. because of dragons and the way that they sort of have this outside like throughout the book tamara talks about 
whether or not he wants to be involved in war yeah. and where his loyalties lie, whether they're to England or to Lawrence and would he... Or to France would he, or... Yeah. Well, not well to Temera. For Temera, it wouldn't be France, but, you know... Um, yeah. But, like, you know, does he... You know, he is loyal to England because Lawrence is loyal to England and he wants to do what Lawrence yeah. wants to do. But there are times when it's like, you know, Lawrence puts his life on the line mm. for England and Temera's like, why are you yeah. doing that? Why? Why would you? Why would you risk? Your life and then Temera is like, actually, I will let any number of other dragons get killed as long as I can rescue you. And Lawrence is like, um, <laughs> yeah. But like, one of the alternate titles we had for this for last week's episode was like, "Help my dragon is a Jacobin." Yeah. <laughs> where there's this conversation where some of the dragons are discussing like ethics, and it's really interesting. Yeah. They basically go like, yeah, they cry no taxation without representation, essentially. They're like, if you can make laws that affect us, we should get a say in the laws. And Lawrence is like, next you'll be throwing tea into the harbour. And I'm just like, Lawrence, Lawrence, you f- They're not wrong, actually. They're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting to have this sort of... The dragons are very clearly people, but they also are not part they they you know they're not part of society but they obviously are very much affected by it and mm. so to see them be able to like you know yeah give their opinions on it even if only to their captains it's just really interesting yeah. and it it does remind me again of the whole like take a step back and look and see if this system is actually working for you um, yeah i i did like how i i think my favorite thing about like the whole terra mare being like a sentient being was just how he was mm. te- he lawrence decided he was going to learn latin to teach terra about Newton's laws of motions, the principle of Mathematica, but like yeah. from the Latin, it just, <laughs> oh, it just, it, but it also, I think, highlights how Temera was kind of also an outsider because his intellect is so much higher than the other dragons. Mm. Like, they can't, I, I kind of got this feeling that they're both kind of outsiders because Temera oh, doesn't know how to act yeah. around other dragons. He's grown up with, like, on the Navy, like, his whole, like, growing mm. up stages in, on a boat. And so yeah. he, he 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 asks a lot of the time of oh can I do that can I spit fire can I spit like acid what mm. do you think I'll be able to do because all I've got is this, like little frilly rough thing and I can't really do much mm-hmm. else mm-hmm. but yeah I, I I really really like that and and just how his his and Lawrence's relationship is just adorable and the fact that again like you were saying that how Temeraire is he's trying to understand his place in the world he's like i want to go to war but i'm scared but at the same time i want to hear your naval battles Mm. you know and yeah just the kind of uh, the the tension between like he doesn't want to follow stupid orders and there are a lot of stupid orders you know he doesn't want to he wants to be free to be actually making that choice you know like there's a moment just before they're due to fight the the sort of climactic battle of the book where Temeraire goes, oh, I think I understand now why you keep saying we have to fight. And it's because it's the um, the one good line that came out of Star Wars The Last Jedi. It's like, it, we're not fighting to destroy what we hate. We're fighting to protect what we love. Mm-hmm. And I think he gets that in that moment. But also that, that the tension in the book is like, that's completely different from what the military... Like, the military is not really designed for that. Yes. Like, it's a good way to get noble people to die for you. But it's yeah. not actually what like half the time that's not the system that they're interacting with and that's not how that's how they get you that's how they get you into the like military industrial I complex mean, of the there british empire but bit where where temera was like talking about how oh who do you fight for and and, and lawrence like oh, i fight for kin and country he's like well temera was like oh, who do i fight for like i'm i i, I, <laughs> I didn't vote for you, you. <laughs> but i i don't know who is this king person like and then he's like, oh well this is is like, well but I don't know who this king is. Can I go visit the king? Can I go and ask him why we're having this war? It was just a really, really cute way of thinking about it because Lawrence Mm -hmm. has this loyalty to this country, but Temeraire's loyalty is to Lawrence, and I think Lawrence alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other dragons, obviously. And I think Temeraire is asking good questions. I mean, did we mention it last time that the quote, um, I think it's a a rabbi, I don't think it's Heschel, but the... um, the child that thinks that everybody should be, oh, um, everything gosh. should be fair and equal and every should, everybody should be happy all the time and get what they want. And the child is right. It, yeah. yeah, it's saying that the child naively thinks, looks at things and goes, oh, this is this is unfair and, you know, the world should be fair. And everyone goes, well, the world's not fair. But the child's like, well, we should make it fair. And the child is right. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah, that is, I've definitely seen that before. And I think that's very much Temeraire's vibe. There's a lot of things mm-hmm. where like, he's asking like really pertinent questions about sort of, yeah, like 
what do I owe a king that I've never met who does a lot of things that I disagree with? Why should I, like, by, from a complete accident of birth, essentially, I am property of this of this person that I've never met, and I must, I've got to fight and die for him. What's that about? Yeah. Yeah, because he does have a very interesting point of, you know, if I'd been on the French yeah. ship, he'd be fighting for the French side. And so it's just pure coincidence that he's fighting for the English side. Yeah, he yeah. doesn't actually have that sort of family loyalty to either country. It's just coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> have we run out? Have we run out of talking about the dragons and ethics? And um... <laughs> <laughs> I do. I had a question. I had a question for you guys actually, which is so. We, I think we've basically already decided that we want to fight Rankin, right? I think we're like, oh, absolutely. That was the conclusion yeah. of the last episode. That we're pretty much all like, we yeah, are going to stomp on Rankin, and there's nothing you can mm. do. Also, Lord Allendale. I th- yeah. yeah, I think yeah, I do fit. very much want to fight Lord Allendale. Close second would be the French spy guy. Yeah, yes. being leery, just yeah, no. yeah, it's bad. Yeah. It's a bad time. But more interesting, since we've been talking a lot about the women, I was wondering, like, mm-hmm. I don't know what the equivalent is. We we don't have a girl gang because Lottie is the only girl here. But <laughs> <laughs> who would we invite to? I'm trying to think gang. of the equivalent of like who would you invite to like your dinner party? Because we also don't really do that. Who would we invite to craft a noon if you had to pick? Zoom dinner party. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who would you invite to join your D and D your D and D party? I think Lady Allendale and Captain <laughs> Roland with the ba- with with baby Roland because it's a mm-hmm. cute child and like. <laughs> and also, I mean, to be honest, I think all of them. Like, apart from the <laughs> lady. Who's okay, you can camp. only pick three. You can oh! only pick three for your hypothetical dinner okay, party. Lady Lady Allendale. Captain Roland and Harkle, because Baby Roland can be babysat by Temera. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Are we including? We're not. We're, this is. We're talking about humans specifically. Oh, that's a good point. Oh, that's a good point. I'm yeah. assuming the dragons. The dragons are coming too. <laughs> They can come to. <laughs> okay, so now we have to sheep. consider people and their drag, like humans and their dragons, as a unit, right? Yeah. Otherwise, we're just there's no space. Because I would want. I would absolutely want to talk to Temera. I would also want to talk about talk to the the messenger dragon where his dragon's just like a big oh donkey. volley James and volley yes. yeah yeah <laughs> volley who's just like you know you know like when you get big ginger boy cats that are just really stupid like they they've never seen a brain cell in their life like yeah that is what this dragon is and I want to hug it's that so dragon. cute but idiot yeah <laughs> basically we love yeah. him. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, I love, I love how like just like solid his relationship with his captain is as well. Yeah, where he's mm. just like, oh, my dragon's an idiot, and I love him so much. It's just like what a perfect representation of cat owners, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I kind of want. I want to get to know Edith better. I've got to say, yeah. I want to get to know Edith better. Yeah. So I'm kind of like, I think she end up with like a kind of annoying man, but she's probably going to be okay with him. I can't remember yeah, how the, end, the book ends up, but you you say that she comes back in later books, Em. So yeah, I yeah. Guess so I just need to we, read. I think we meet her future husband, and Lawrence is kind of like he's a tool, uh, actually. Yeah, he's like he's not good <laughs> enough for her, but it's none of my business. So I'm gonna stay. Yeah, out there. basically. Yeah, mm-hmm. I need to read the rest of this series. Basically, yeah, I need so to. Good. But I, th- here's the issue, though. It's just gonna consume me for yeah. however long I'm reading them, and I need to make space in my life for that to be a possibility <laughs> i think we're just gonna have to like have a, like a, just a set book like podcast episodes on just this series just because we systematically <laughs> start going through them well, that brings us quite nicely into what else we've been reading exactly um and <laughs> i was gonna say i finished the book that i was reading ages ago i mentioned it on this podcast like mm. months and months and months ago of the end times which is a book about how all, all of the different things that could cause humanity to go extinct mm-hmm. and if you can believe it i did skip the chapter on plague um, yeah that's valid <laughs> that is so uh, but it valid. was really good it was depressing it was super depressing and scary but it was really informative <laughs> so that's what i've been reading and now i'm going to well i'm going to read the rest of the Tamara series because i need some like light fluffy something in my life <laughs> oh boy okay book. um stop before book five. Oh, okay does it get does it get real does it get serious okay so like they're all pretty much like steadily going into like maybe the british empire is the bad guys actually with all the kind of attendant yeah of that but book five is like lawrence's depression book oh no book five is like lawrence is in a is having a really really bad time he does get out of it but it's a good like it's a good stopping point you're like i need to you're gonna be the one who's lending the books to me anyway so you can just cut (laughs) me off at the the appropriate point yes this is true lottie what else have you been reading i mean i haven't really i mean as i mentioned earlier like what i've been reading reading in advance for future book Mm -hmm, episodes mm -hmm. but 
looking at our like our instagram and like the people we follow on our on our instagram page at mm-hmm. teach uh teach my cat to read for the little two number two mm-hmm. there was one book that cropped up a lot which is called legend born by uh tracy okay. dion and it's it is it all i can, all i've sort of worked out is like it's a really diverse book and it's set in like future america plus magic but it's like if the descendants of like the round table but it, so it's, a, it's basically our theory and adventure with southern black culture and i'm Ooh. i was just and it's so i was gonna read it and see if, if i enjoy it if we could do it on the podcast but oh yeah, nice I, yeah i've downloaded on it i haven't sourced it yet but um yeah it just just proof that on the bookstagram posts like i we are making a note of books <laughs> that keep cropping up on our feet especially those that and i mean for me personally like i'd love to read more diverse books more mm. like queer stories more uh, just 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 more stories that are outside of my like straight white female mm. life you know that that sort of <laughs> that, that that's where i am and Fair so yeah enough. it'd be nice to read more more books outside of that so i'm i'm starting that soon and i'm really looking forward to it awesome nice what about you em um, well, I've been I've done that thing again where I pick up multiple nonfiction books and don't finish any of them. <laughs> so <laughs> I am in the middle of uh, Conflict is Not Abuse by Sarah Shulman, which is the subtitle is Overstating Harm, Community Responsibility and the Duty of Repair, uh, which kind Ooh. of I think covers everything that I've seen in it so far. It's it's I'm really enjoying it. It's very it's difficult, you know, because I feel like there's a lot of things that I agree with. And then there's things where I'm like. Oh, I don't, I don't, I can't tell whether I'm uncomfortable with this because I genuinely disagree with it or because this is a bad habit that I have and I'm feeling defensive, you know, Mm -hmm, it's like, mm -hmm. it's going to, it's going to take my brain apart. I can tell, but it is very interesting and I'm, I've been meaning to read it for ages. So that's, uh, yeah, that's good. And I also started Eat Up by Ruby Tando, which I don't really know how to describe it. It's a book about food and about how amazing food is and how good eating is and how much we should all enjoy it and not worry about it too much basically excellent that's um, she, she was the one on bake that's off, very wasn't pleasing she? was she the one on bake off yes yes, yes she was yes, yes. and she has a great twitter account ah uh, like excellent. she's really funny on twitter as you can see we're big bake off fans here. so yeah that's that's a nice like it, that's been my gentle reading like and my brain gets taken apart by sarah shulman and like stabbed a bunch and then i pick <laughs> up the eat up and i'm just like i'm going to enjoy these really like good descriptions of good food now Excellent. That yeah, sounds a like nice a good break. combo. <laughs> and I'll tell you what I'm going to be reading in the very near future is The Hobbit, because that is going to be our next episode, or our next couple episodes, because we are once again doing a two-parter, because we, we actually know this time that we're going to have way too yeah. much to say. Yeah. This is a planned two-parter. This has been scheduled from the beginning, unlike this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so our proposed plan is that the first episode, we will not be discussing the wider, the wider Tolkien legendarium, or the adaptation including the films yeah. so we will be solely talking about the book itself just the book alone yeah and then the second episode it will be a free-for-all on ragging on the adaptations and talking about <laughs> wider Tolkien stuff because like god only knows if we're ever going to do an actual Lord of the Rings I was about to say episode but series it would take us forever we'd have to devote like a whole year to I, it I'm, su- I'm such a bad like fantasy nerd but I've never read Lord of the Rings so <gasps> it would have yeah. to be a whole sub podcast oh my god like, that's so cool though you're gonna be coming in it like completely fresh I mean all I've wa- I've watched the films yeah but like it's different the books are so funny like they're unexpectedly mm. funny anyway this is all stuff we could be talking about <laughs> next episode <laughs> um, but as you can tell we're really excited to to, to to do some do some Tolkien and yeah starting with the Hobbit and yeah I'm I'm so so stoked because I'm the world's like biggest Tolkien fan uh, and we will also very excitingly be joined by our audio editor and general coordinator and maker of making the podcast happen Rowan herder of cats Woo! yeah very so exciting. that's that's going to be awesome yeah yeah so we'll see you then. Yeah, so yeah, thank you all so much for listening. Please like, subscribe, and um, review us on your podcast platform if you're able to, and share it on your on your social medias. Because um, seriously, like every time we get like a little like on our on our Instagram or a share or <laughs> anything, we just go around on our little on our group chat, and it's just very exciting. So seriously, it makes our day. <laughs> See this? Somebody said something nice about us. Look, I know. look, look! It's so yeah. exciting yeah. when we get a little email. Someone saying, "Oh, I really liked your podcast." Oh, it's just so exciting. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, if you do want send us an email um you can see the contact information on our website or you can send us an email to teaching my cat to read at gmail.com to being to you just add hello there in the subject title so we know you're not spam because yeah we get spam 
Um, so yeah, <laughs> say hello, send us a message and recommend us some books to read. Big virtual hugs and we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.